Hello everyone and welcome to Issues and Debates Lesson 4, Nature versus Nurture. Now, just before I start, just a reminder that in an exam, the Issues and Debates topic comes up in Paper 3. Uh, paper 3 is very, very essay heavy and so any topic that comes up in Paper 3 is highly likely to be an essay. That being said, there aren't just essays, you can get other types of questions as well. So hopefully, if you get a question on the nature and nurture debate, um, hopefully this video will help you answer questions like the following. So here, nice little application question. Um, refer to three types of determinism in your answer, but refer to the um, refer to the stem. Um, identify one influence of nature on our behavior and one influence of nurture on our behavior, again referencing the stem. So application questions are very nice in this type of topic. You've also got 16 mark essays that are, that are fairly easy to give and fairly likely to come your way if this topic comes up. Um, but again, here you've got a 16 marker with an application bit, so it gives you a little quote and you need to be able to refer to the quote in your answer. And then you've also got a bog standard 16 mark essay as well. Um, however, the difficulty with this one is that you have to be able to refer to two topics that you've studied um, over the last two years. Now, those topics can be approaches or they can be any of the other topics as well, um, but you do have to make sure that you refer to them. So just bear that in mind. Obviously, this type of exam question can come alongside any one marker or two marker that says things like um, briefly explain the nature-nurture debate. You know, that, that's also something that could come up. Okay, let's make a start. So what is the debate Simply put, the nature-nurture debate is the question as to whether a person's development is down to their genes or down to environmental influences. So the nature side of the argument is that behavior is a product of innate predetermined factors, whereas the nurture side of the argument is that behavior is a product of environmental influences. That is the basics of the debate. Okay, a couple of key terms and phrases for you there. Feel free to pause the video here and just take a little look at those and um, take any notes that you might want to take, and we'll crack on. So, we're going to start off with the influence of nature on our behavior. So, the influence of nature is very much focused on genetic explanations or biology. Okay, so for example, Family and twin studies and adoption studies show that the closer two individuals are genetically, the more likely they are that both of them will develop the same behavior. So they look at things like concordance rates, um, and the concordance rate of a mental disorder, such as schizophrenia, is about 40% for monozygotic twins and 7% for dizygotic twins. So the closer the similarity for individuals who share the same genes shows that nature has a major contribution to the disorder. Now, 40% isn't huge, but it is definitely more than 7%, and so genetic explanations would suggest that there is a genetic basis for conditions like schizophrenia. Um, nature also uses evolutionary explanations as well. So, natural selection. Any behavior or trait that promotes survival and reproduction will be naturally selected and as such behaviors and characteristics are adaptive and the genes for such behaviors will be passed on to subsequent generations. Um, so an example of that in psychology is attachment. So Bowlby. Bowlby's theory is an evolutionary theory. Um, attachment according to Bowlby is an adaptive behavior because it promotes survival through protection. So you attach to your primary caregiver because that primary caregiver is the person that's going to help you survive. So it also promotes close relationships that would foster successful reproduction as well. So attachment behaviors are naturally selected because not only do they promote survival, they also foster successful reproduction as well. And that process of natural selection can only be done through genetic 
mechanisms, so it is an influence of nature. Now on the other side, a couple of examples of influences of nurture. Um, so you've got, for example, the behaviorist explanations for behavior. So that's all about the environment. So behaviorists assume that all behavior can be explained in terms of experience, that all of our behaviors are the product of classical and operant conditioning. So again, if you think for uh, psychology, you've got attachment, the idea of becoming attached through food, becoming classically conditioned because your primary caregiver it becomes associated with the pleasure of receiving food, um, and then the drive reduction that a baby experiences um, when they're hungry they experience discomfort and so mum feeds them and then that discomfort goes away so you've got the operant conditioning working there now you've also got in terms of nurture you've got social learning theory as well so Banjora and his view is a little bit less extreme than traditional behaviorism Banjora also believed that behavior was learnt through the environment. However, he also added on that new dimension of vicarious reinforcement, so indirect reinforcement. So if you remember from when you did the approaches topic, vicarious reinforcement is seeing somebody else get rewarded or punished for a behavior, which then has an impact on whether or not you decide to carry out that behavior. So Banjora was very clear on the fact that biology does have a role to play so for example somebody might have the urge to behave aggressively so that might be very biological that might be genetic or personality or, or something like that but the point here is that the way a person learns to express the anger is through environmental influences so social learning theory is still um, an example of nurture Okay, at that point, I'm just going to give you a couple of note-taking opportunities. Now, the problem with the nature-nurture debate is that there is no clear winner. There can't ever be a clear winner because in terms of the nature-nurture debate, there it's a question that's impossible to answer. Now, environmental influences begin as soon as a child is born. You can't ever remove the environmental influences. So nature and nurture are so intertwined from the moment we are born that it makes no sense whatsoever to separate the two. Not only does it make no sense to separate the two, it's actually very, very difficult to separate the two as well. And I'll give you an example of that. When trying to establish whether mental illness is genetic or at least has a genetic basis, People very often conduct twin studies, so they use identical twins to see whether there's a degree of similarity in the symptoms or in the condition that, that is being studied. So the idea is that if two identical twins have a higher degree of similarity in terms of specific traits, i.e. they have a higher concordance rate than non-identical twins, then it is assumed that the condition has a genetic basis. So as I said earlier, the concordance rate for identical twins and schizophrenia is about 40%, and for non-identical twins, it's 7%. So the assumption is that based on those concordance rates, schizophrenia has a genetic basis. However, there is no real way to find out or at least it can't be easily established, whether those high concordance rates are the results of shared genetics, because identical twins share 100% of their genes, or whether it's down to a shared upbringing, because identical twins more often than not also share the same environment. So they've both had the, the same genes from the moment they were born, and they've also most likely both had the same environment from the moment they were born as well. So how do you then separate the two? So because of that, and because of the difficulty of that question, psychologists don't really look at whether it's nature or nurture anymore. They tend to now focus on the contribution that both nature and nurture have individually on the things that we do and the way that we think. 
So there's a little note taking opportunity for that one as well. Now, we're gonna move on to the evaluation bit. Now at this point, it's important to reference that when you are evaluating the nature nurture debate, we look at reasons why nature nurture can't be separated. So the evaluation section is very much an argument for the fact that nature and nurture interact and that neither one nor the other can ever be solely responsible for behavior. Okay, so what I will do is I will take you through a couple and then at the end I will put all of the ones that I've gone through up on the screen as a peel paragraph so that you can write anything down that you want um, and before then I'll just quickly explain them to you. Okay, so the first one we're going to look at is an example as to why nature nurture can't be separated. So we're going to use the example of a psychologist called Donald Hebb. And Donald Hebb said that asking which is more important, nature or nurture, was a little bit like asking whether the width or the length of a triangle was more important when measuring its area. They're both equally important. They both contribute, and, sh and so they should never be considered separately. Now, an example of that is a condition called phenylketonuria, which is an inherited disorder that prevents amino acid that prevents the amino acid phenylalanine being metabolized, and that results in brain damage and learning difficulties. However, if the condition is detected at birth, an infant can be given a diet that's devoid of this particular amino acid, and thus the brain damage is averted. So, if prevention of a condition, prevention of a genetic condition, can, can be achieved through an environmental manipulation, as in I change my diet, then surely the condition isn't purely genetic. Um, so the condition, therefore, is not due to nature or nurture. It's actually an interplay between both of them. Moving on, there's another example here as well. Um, I don't know if you've come across this yet in your studies. If you haven't, you will come across it fairly soon, I would imagine. Um, so there's also the diathesis stress model. Now, the diathesis stress model is a model that is used very often in explaining mental disorders such as phobias, depression, schizophrenia, that kind of thing. And the diathesis stress model suggests that people are um, perhaps born with a genetic vulnerability to a particular condition like phobias, like depression, like schizophrenia. However, those people may never actually develop the condition. They may, not, they may, never, uh, may never have it. However, if they come into contact with certain environmental stressors, like um, a trauma, let's say, then it could cause the expression of that gene, and it could cause the condition to develop. So again, you've got environment and nature. You've got nature and nurture. You've got the genetic vulnerability, the nature side of things, but you've got the nurture side of things in that that vulnerability will never actually express itself unless something happens in the environment to trigger it. Okay, so that's a very, very popular and common model to use when trying to explain um, mental disorders such as phobias or schizophrenia. So further support for the interaction between nature and nurture was suggested by Scar and McCartney in 1983. So Scar and McCartney actually suggested that genes um, exert an indirect effect on us in a number of different ways. So first off, they suggest something called passive interactions. So they suggest that a parent's genes influence the way that they treat their children. So, for example, musically gifted parents are likely to play to their children more and encourage their children's engagement with music. So it's the parent's nature that is determining the type of nurture that they create for their children. So again, that's passive interaction of genes. You've then got something called evocative interaction, and that is when the child's genes influence and shape the environment that they grow up in. So, for example, the musically talented child 
will be picked for school concerts and given other special opportunities. So it's the child's genes that is influencing his environment. So the nature is influencing and shaping the nurture. Finally, you've also got something called active interaction, which is when the child creates its own environment through the people and experiences that it selects. So the child, in this example, chooses similar musically talented friends and seeks out musical experiences. So again, the child, because of its nature, creates its own nurture by picking out certain people that it wants to be around. And then those people that it's picked and those experiences that it's chosen will then go on to affect that child that's all part of the nurture. So again, that points to a very complex and multi-layered relationship between nature and nurture. Okay, so that is the end of the evaluation points there. I realize I've given you quite a lot of information in a fairly quick amount of time. If they haven't made sense or if you've struggled to get your head around them, then uh, you can always go back and listen to them again. Alternatively, you can keep watching and in the next couple of slides, you're going to get all of the evaluation points as peel paragraphs as well. So it might help you to read them first and then go back. You'll notice as well, I've got four peel paragraphs for you, even though I only explained three evaluation points. That fourth peel paragraph is just another one that I've thrown in at the end there. You will only need three, so choose all the ones that you that you like. And if you are really pushing um, for a fourth evaluation point, then you've always got that one at the end as well. Okay, that'll be the final one. So here we go. And remember, you can pause at any time to take any notes that you want to take. There's the Nature and Nurture one with phenylketonuria. You've got the diathesis stress model right there. This is passive, evocative and active interactions. So nature affects nurture. And then the final one, shared and unshared environments. Okay, that is now the end of the video. I hope it's been useful and uh, thank you very much for listening.